So here I'm going to talk a little bit about the economics of the gold standard. Standard. I talk about this uh, a lot of times in international economics, international finance. Also, I talk about it in intermediate macro as well as sometimes in principles of macro. So it's interesting because a lot of times people talk about it even to this day. A lot of times people advocate for the gold standard, even though it was most popular more than 100 years ago. Right. So. Now, the economics kind of builds on some macroeconomics I talk about in my intermediate classes. So the central bank has a balance sheet, and I talk about this elsewhere. And so the assets, which are the things the central bank holds, are the domestic assets like treasury bills and foreign assets, as well as gold, all right? which again, the U.S. doesn't hold too much, but other countries do, and in the past they held more. And then the money supply is on the right, that's currency and reserves, and that's the, the narrowest definition of money, it's the monetary base, right? It could, you could talk about M1 as well, currency and deposits, sometimes the entire money supply is backed by gold, but here I'm just keeping it with what I usually talk about, that this is the monetary base and it can expand and multiply into M1, right? Just to remember, assets equals liabilities. If one side increases, the other side increases as well. And then I talk elsewhere about how domestic asset purchases increase the money supply through open market operations. Foreign asset pur purchases can be used to uh, weaken a currency all right, on the foreign side. And then the gold standard, you can also have gold purchases or gold acquisition increasing uh, the money supply as well. All right, and so that's what I'm going to talk about now is the gold standard. And then you can print bonds and buy them. Obviously, you cannot print gold and buy it, and so gold is much more fixed in terms of how much it can affect money supply. Right? Now, in the extreme case, um, uh, sometimes countries get into trouble doing this. Governments issue bonds, just like corporations do, to fi finance debt. Right? You can actually borrow money. You take money today for a piece of paper that pays off in a couple, 10, 20 years. And you can print those bonds and get money today. All right? A, a strong country like the U.S., uh, individuals and businesses and countries can buy those bonds and then that finances expenditures and those people make a rate of return as, as the p money they pay kind of grows into the face value of the bond. Right? But some countries get into trouble because they have weak markets, there's no trust, there's a huge amounts of risk, the government has weakness. Uh, public does not buy the bonds, all right? and so who does? The central bank buys those bonds. Okay, And so the central bank is going to buy domestic assets. And on this side, because they're paying out money as they take in bonds, they're paying people money for that, all right? they're putting money into circulation, all right? then the money supply goes up. Okay, and so the monetary base goes up, the money supply goes up, and then we talk about the equation of exchange, prices go up much more than output. And so a lot of times countries can basically monetize the debt. They print money to pay for the government spending, but it also inflates the debt away. As inflation rises, the real value falls, and so governments can actually borrow a bunch of money and then watch it lose value through inflation. All right? So a lot of times people don't like inflation. They, they want something that limits government's ability to issue bonds and buy it themselves. Right? So, again, buying those domestic bonds leads to an increase in currency and reserves, which is the monetary base, which will lead to inflation. Right? So, and this is the equation I'm referring to. This is the uh, quantity theory or the equation of exchange. There's different names for it. But money supply times the velocity of money, which is the amount of times each dollar or currency is spent, equals price level times output. This is actually nominal uh, GDP. Um, in, as the multiple, but it's it's price level times real. Okay, and so sometimes you can boost the money supply to boost output and GDP. Sometimes it's a mix. Inflation and output both grow up, but go up. But a lot of times people say like increasing the money supply only leads to inflation. All right, so then you might say, well, I want stable prices, and that's an internal objective for the country. And if people like order and stability, then linking the money supply to something that cannot really be created very easily limits government's ability to create money okay and so gold can only be mined and shipped over it can be acquired through exports and imports you can get people to turn in their jewelry and so forth countries have a little control over it but it's not as uh, expandable as maybe just printing pieces of paper right so that can be good if you like stability but there's a problem because this these this is fixed. Money supply is fixed because gold is fixed. Velocity under uh, Milton Friedman is assumed to be stable. So these don't change. So if output grows, GDP is growing, which is good, you can't print money to accommodate all those new purchases. Prices will have to fall because there's a limited amount of gold to pay for more stuff. So everything kind of has to cost less gold. Okay, that can be deflation, and people, you think deflation is good because stuff costs less. What happens if it's your wage that goes down? And a big thing that I'll talk about is uh, what happens if you're if you have debt. Okay, so debt can make, uh, debt actually goes up if prices go down. Okay, so. 
Um, you can also remember from an international perspective. And I talk about the open economy trilemma. Some of them called the o uh, unholy trinity and, and other names, but you choose two of three. Fixed exchange rate, free capital movement, and an independent monetary policy. This had no independent monetary policy. Countries had fixed their exchange rates, which I'll talk about next, and gold was allowed to move around the world. You could ship it, um, and so capital could move. Co exchange rates were fixed, but countries actually had no control over their monetary policy, and that was kind of big back in the day. All right? Now, in, in addition to the uh, uh, internal objective, there's the external objective, which is the trade balance. So if countries don't like trade deficits, um, or surpluses, th this will actually balance it out. Okay, And so there's more I could talk about how um, this is a basically self-regulating economy. Okay, And if, if you're classical thinking and you want prices and, and money and stuff to just regulate itself with limited government in intervention, this, this is something that, that would appeal to you. The reason is, is because if there's a problem, this equation and, and the equations in the, in the balance sheet will actually bring back equilibrium and take away the problem, right? So let's say you're running a trade deficit, okay? Your trade balance is negative, M is greater than X, okay? And, and even in the U.S. people complain about this, right? You're importing too much. Now, if you're not sending goods to pay for your imports, what are you sending? And so you could just ship people gold to pay for your imports, okay? So you're importing more than you're exporting, and you're paying for it with gold. Well, what happens is your gold goes down over here. Oops. Nope, not happening. Um, your gold goes down over here, and then your uh, reserves go down as well, all right? Here we go. So, so as your gold decreases, all right, um, as you pay for your imports, and then you are actually reducing your money supply, okay? And so what could happen there? Well, what that means is that if you have less money to buy stuff, it's going to uh, lower your income based on that equation. And it could also lower prices as well. So less income means less uh, imports. And if the prices fall, that means that your, pr your products are more competitive on world markets, okay? And so that means that uh, basically this, this trade imbalance is self-correcting because you're shipping away gold and that's going to restore equilibrium. Sometimes this is called the price specie flow mechanism. Specie is another word for precious metals. You're shipping away your precious metals and your trade surplus is gone, okay? And so this will restore equilibrium with very little government intervention, okay? Now, this was very popular before World War I, okay, uh, before 1914. And, and actually, macroeconomics did not exist as a discipline. Uh, governments had no real interest in me in even measuring GDP. They talked about stability. Um, they had they could raise interest rates and do stuff to kind of you know bring in gold. But really, this was very much having an economy on autopilot, uh, basically having gold control the money supply. So, the, a little bit of the math is that there's 480 grains of gold in a troy ounce. You know, gold is oftentimes priced in ounces. Uh, Britain at one time had its pound said it was worth 113 grains of gold. The U.S., one dollar was worth less. It was 23 grains of gold, so a dollar's worth less than Britain. You can do the math. Four pounds, 25, is equal to $20.67. So $20.67 was worth an ounce of gold. And you could trade that at the central bank, okay? But because these are equal, that's also a fixed exchange rate. If you divide by 4.25, you can get the value of a pound, okay? Now, there you could go up a little bit because there's shipping costs, right, to put gold on a boat. So you, there could be a little fluctuation around this, but if it rose too much or fell too much, people would actually be able... An ounce of gold could maybe buy $21 in America, so you'd ship your gold to America, and then that would actually bring your money supply down and restore equilibrium, okay? So this was a very stable system. One thing you could do is devalue your currency, and so you have the same amount of gold, you could just say that an ounce of gold is worth $25 or something. Um, after uh, World War II, during the Bretton Woods system, a dollar was worth, excuse me, an ounce of gold was $35, so the dollar was a little bit weaker. You could do a devaluation, which would make your currency worth less gold and also less foreign currency, okay? But that was a problem because, uh, you know, even though it's a stable for bankers and stable for the financial system, some people were against this, okay? So the early 20th century was very much known for issues with limited money supply, and they talked about the free silver movement, all right? Um, and so you cannot, you know, if you could devalue your currency, you can make more money here. Um, one other thing I'll quickly say is that this oftentimes currencies are devalued if um, there's a war, 
because you have to pay soldiers and pay for a war with no more gold than you had before. And so devaluations oftentimes happen during war. But under normal times, people just are limited, right? The economy's growing, you can't create gold, and so there could be deflation, and that, that could hurt farmers, for example, okay? I'll talk about that in a second. So people today like... Um, you know, the, the really more libertarian people, I guess, more conservative people might say, well, this is good because you don't have an activist government. The government does not control GDP or jobs. The government just lets stable money. There's low or no inflation, which is good. It keeps the value of investments stable, right? And so it's good in that sense. It's stable, but it does have a few drawbacks. One thing is that not all prices move equally. Uh, some prices get cut before others. Uh, if there's deflation, some get raised before others, and so maybe your wage get cut, gets cut or maybe your rent goes up you know, but the other prices don't adjust, that can hurt people asymmetrically, right? One thing is that farmers especially, uh, as well as some workers who work for wages, they might get hit more, right? This could, this could be good for investments, but what if your main thing is for wages? But farmers long ago really had an issue because their debt, uh, they, they went into debt to they could plant crops, and then they paid it off when the harvest came. But deflation can actually make your, the real value of your debt go up. Right. So, for example, if I owe you $100 and a bushel of grain is $2, I owe you 50 bushels of grain. But if it goes down, the price of grain goes down to 1, I now owe you not 50, I owe you 100 bushels of grain. So I owe you more if prices go down. All right. So that the inability to create gold when you need that currency uh, is a big drawback. And so long ago, people would talk about adding silver and stuff. But now, the more conservative, if you are conservative, you might say uh, monetarism is better, which is Milton Friedman's idea that the Federal Reserve does control money, but they limit money creation. That might be preferred just to have some sort of a rule that you can't create money, right? You can buy bonds and stuff, but you can't create too much money. There might be a rule that you can have a fixed percent or something tied to GDP, right? But gold standard was really big in, before World War One. It came back after World War Two until about 1973 under the Bretton Woods system, and people today do advocate for it. But the whole idea is that it's stable and orderly, as long as you're willing to deal with nothing cushioning shocks, right? You can't create money to create jobs. You're just basically tying your money supply over here with the gold supply over here.